view of that for a minute. Then we're going to talk about, I guess we could say three things sort of rolled into one. We'll do bits and pieces and hopefully when we're done everything will be taken care of. Um, we're going to talk about some sort of additional miscellaneous form stuff that we didn't get to last time. So some loose ends. So I'll try to work the loose ends into uh, the discussion uh, of the other two items. Um, the other one is um, styling your forms, making your forms look good. Um, and associated with that is accessibility. So those three things taken together will kind of do uh, all at the same time and, and hopefully you know by the end of the end of the class period we'll, we'll have covered all of them adequately. All right, let's look, uh, take a second to look at the form that we did last time. And actually, the form that we did last time was actually a bunch of forms. We did um, a little input form that was hooked up to Google at the other end to do some searches. And we did it several different ways because we wanted to explore several different um, techniques for, for, um, for, for form elements. Designing and choosing your, your form elements is important. Um, you, have to, you have to take into account, first of all, what the script on the other end is expecting. All right? Both in terms of the names of the data and the values of the data. One thing I do want to point out, and I think I've pointed out before, is uh, for your assignment about the pizza form. Um, I have in, in the text of that a table of what, the form, what needs to be in the form. Don't take that as that is how the form should look. All right? That's simply a description of the stuff that needs to be in the form. All right? But at any rate, deciding what form controls you're going to use and, and so on is important. Um, you, have to, you have to know what the script is expecting. And again, a lot of times there's database considerations because a lot of times these forms will be connected to a database. So at any rate, let's just look at a couple of these forms that we have within this one page. Again, first of all, form tag has two attributes, the method and the action. The method is how the data is going to be passed from the form to the action. And the action is the name of the server-side script that is going to get executed. Oftentimes, again, you're creating both the form and the script that processes it, so you will, you know, you'll know the name. You will, you will have made up the name of the script that's going to process the data. But in this case, again, some reverse engineering was done, and it was determined that that's the name of the script that we should call if we are going to do a Google search. And what's more, our form fields need to have the names that it's expecting as well. So this text box needs to have the name Q. This checks checkbox needs to have a name of uh, site search. And again, you see how we have the input tag with uh, type equals text, input type equals checkbox, and then finally a submit button. The submit button is what actually goes and sends the, the data to the server and um, lets the server process it. We're able to do this with two text boxes. We have radio buttons. Key with radio buttons is they all have the same name. That way um, they know to act like a radio button group as opposed to separate radio buttons or separate radio button groups. We have a drop down which again does not use the input tag unlike many of the others. It has a select tag and it has a series of options. And I think that's about it. Any questions over what we covered last time regarding forms? All right. What I want to do then is I want to create a new form. And this form we're not going to hook up to any server-side script. All right. So we're not going to actually process the data. We're just doing this just to explore some of the form things uh, that you can do. Um, I'm going to start right off the bat uh, by talking about the styling and accessibility of the forms. First of all, let's say we wanted to, let's say this is a form associated with, um, you know, placing an order online. 
When you place an order online, you might have, uh, you know, your address information and you might have your credit card information, two sort of separate groups of information. So we'll look at, at, at how to do that. First thing we're going to do is let's, let's make a little form to put in the, uh, your, your name, address, city, state, and zip. So let's go in here and I'll go in a notepad. Oops. All right, first thing I'm going to do as far as styling this goes is I'm going to put my form controls in a unordered list. All right, many people put form controls in tables. Um, I don't particularly like that. I do not use tables for anything except for tables of data. And um, it seems to me that a unordered list is uh, is a more accurate way to describe what a form is. You know, forms a list of values, all right. And therefore, I'm going to use an unordered list to to style my form. So I'm going to start by putting a ul and an nul, and then for each each of the uh, parts of my address, I'm going to put an li. So li, name, now, Now, let's talk a second about accessibility. Let me put a couple other fields in here too. All right, here's what our form looks like now. We can save it, and we'll see our unordered list of form elements. All right, now, someone that can see knows what that element is, All right? That's the address. How do they see that? How, how do you tell that? You know, it might seem like a dumb question, but you tell that because the label address is right next to the form field. So of course it's going to be address. You know, there's no ambiguity at all. It's easily understood. Much as in, much as in the same way as in a table, a user looks and can see the row and can see the column it's in and they can know what the data is that way. All right. So people that can see make that visual association based on how it's lined up. Again, if a screen reader is reading it, you might find yourself in a field and not know what the field is, what the field represents. All right? That's why we can use, uh, that's why we use a label tag. And the label tag works like this. All right? It associates the label with the form element. So let's just look at the first one.
Actually, I'm going to break these out so they're on separate lines. On my Li, I have a label tag, and it says label for txt name. All right. What is txt name? txt name is the form control that has an ID of txt name. Notice, and again, you're not seeing double. All right. Notice I have a name and an ID both for this text field. Those are used for different purposes. And it's, it's pretty common to have for your text fields both names and IDs. And to keep it straight, I, I usually keep them the same. So if I, whatever name I give it, I'll also give it the same ID in most cases. All right. Different things use the name, different things use the ID. The server-side script, for example, uses the name. This label uses the ID. So this label 4 matches up with the ID. All right. Uh, we could do the same thing for address. And I'll do it for city, state, and zip as well. So again, this will help the screen reader associate the label associated with the field with the name of the field. It effectively accomplishes for someone who's visually impaired and using the screen reader what you do with your eyes, and that is you visually match up those two fields together. So. If we look at this in the browser, we're not going to notice any difference, at least not yet. Because really, the label just sort of logically groups the form control. Oops, we do notice the difference because I typed wrong. But other than that, here we go. We don't really notice a difference. All right. But now the screen reader can associate this with that. Why? Because it knows the ID of this thing, knows the ID of this text box, and it knows what is the label for that ID. So the ID for this is txt zip. What's the label for txt zip? Well, this is. So it's the zip code. All right. Now, how can we use this label tag to our advantage as far as styling goes? Well, if we look at this form, um, it doesn't look real good, right? Um, some of the things I don't like about it, I don't like the bullet points, you know, it doesn't really look good. I also don't like the fact that those text boxes don't line up. All right. It would be nice if there was a clean margin and all the text box lined up that way. So let's go and let's see if we can address that using our friend CSS. So we go in the head section and again, sort of my disclaimer, this should ideally appear in an external style sheet, but just in the interest of keeping um, everything in the same file so it's easier to talk about, I'm putting it in the page itself. First thing I'm going to do is Let's 
Someone tell me what this is going to do. Take off the bullet points, exactly. Or not. List style type, none. List style none, none. There we go. So we take off the dots. All right. What do you suppose we can do to put some space between these things? Notice how those, those form fields are like just crammed up right next to each other. Add some padding on the LI or add a margin on the LI? Either one. And I'm just saying form UL and form LI, just to illustrate, first of all, just to demonstrate that you can use selectors like that. And what that means is any UL that's inside of a form, all right, gets the style rule. And um, secondly, because, you know, um, the, the unordered list in a form, we might want to treat a little different than the uh, unordered list elsewhere on the page. So I'm, I'm just doing uh, that that way. So I'll do a margin top, let's say, of 10px. All right, so now we got a little bit of a space in between them. All right, how do you suppose we could line up all of these in a nice line like that? Any thoughts? We could center it. Um, let's see what that will do. I don't think that's going to do exactly what I had in mind, but that, that might be good. That might be uh, another option. Well, that looks better, but it's still not lined up. What else do you think we could do? How about if we give each one of these widths, each one of these labels a width? That way the form element will, you know, if we make the label a constant width, then the form element will go to a certain spot and then the text box will start right next to it. So let's go in here and let's put a style rule that says label width, and let's say 50 pixels. Didn't do anything. Any idea why it didn't do anything? Didn't do anything because some attributes only work on block tags versus inline tags. A label is an inline tag, and therefore um, a width attribute isn't going to work for it. What's a little cheat to make a tag kind of work as a hybrid and work both as an inline tag and as a block tag? We can say display. inline block. All right. What does display inline block do? Well, again, you know the difference between an inline and a block tag. At a glance, we can see that the label is an inline tag, right? Because the, the label and then the text box is immediately after it. If the label were a block tag, it would be below it. Now, the inline block display type gets around the dilemma of not being able to give certain attributes on inline tags. For example, you can't give a width on an inline tag. Well, if you make it an inline block 
it will still act like an inline tag, yet you can apply styles to it as though it's a block tag. So it's kind of best of both worlds. This is, this is a trick that I use a lot of times in, in styling the code. If, if, you can't make, if you can't apply an attribute to a block, uh, I'm sorry, to an inline tag, make the display type inline block and then you can usually do it. Now I might want to go a little bit further spread out. So let's make the width 70 pixels. All right, there we go. How could we put the text of these labels right alongside the text box? Because now there's a gap between zip and uh, you mean right align them. Right so all the colons are like. What would I put the text align attribute on? I thought it would have to be where So it would be on the label, right? Well, uh, whether it's in line or block doesn't affect whether it's. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't um, you, you? You can write a line a block tag, right? You can write write a line a paragraph or an H1 or whatever. So you can go here and say text align. Right. And now we have a form that's starting to look pretty, pretty spiffy. All right. What could we use instead of a text box for, um, for state? A yeah, drop down. Probably wouldn't want to use a radio button, right? That would take up too much space on the screen. Um, probably um, could you use check boxes. Well, yeah, it would take up a lot of space. What's the other issue with it? Yeah, you could check more than one. I live in Ohio and also Hawaii, you know. It wouldn't really make sense. Why, what's, an, well, well, what's one reason that you might want to put, keep the state as a text box, though? What's one reason you might want to keep the state as a text box? Right. But if, if, you're, if this was worldwide, they could be put in any kind of location. Yeah, I exactly. Uh, in other words, um, if, if we were 100% sure that, that this was for US people only, then it might be a good idea to make a drop down for state. But if it was, you know, even North America, you know, um, you know, uh, I, I imagine there's states or regions in Mexico. I know there's provinces in Canada. And rather than having a drop down that would contain all of those, which could be potentially confusing, um, you could make that. The other thing that you might want to do on this is rephrase these a little bit and say state slash province uh, zip slash postal code. So uh, a lot of a lot of countries uh, have postal codes, but they don't call them zip codes. All right, and we might have to adjust the width of these things now. Let's make the width wider. All right, there we go. And now we have uh, our form that looks pretty nice, I would say. I mean, it's simple, but but it's nice. All right, we should probably add a submit button on here.
I don't know, I'm pretending we're placing an order here, so I'll give the submit button a value of place order. All right. Well, I don't like that. What should we do instead? How could, how could we make this look better? Right? I don't like the fact that the button is over here. I'd kind of rather have the button over here. How could we make that button over there? Well, one way is we could give a left margin to it, right? So what I could do is... Give it a left margin of 150 pixels, let's say, or 170 pixels for that matter. And there, we're looking, looking good again. All right. Now. One thing that you often have on forms is you have sets of fields that go together, right? Um, if you're placing an order, for example, you might have your billing address information. You might have your shipping address information. You might have your uh, credit card information. You might have your gift wrap information or something like that. The idea is, is those are three collections of fields that sort of are grouped together, right? One thing that you can do, and this helps both accessibility and it helps for people that can see just to conceptually divide your form, is you can use a field set. What a field set does is effectively it groups your form together um, into sections. So. What I could do is I could put around this UL oops, a field set tag. And I could give it a legend which is sort of like what a caption is on a table, a legend is for a form or for a field set. So I could put a legend here for billing information. And now, by default, that's what the form looks like. billing information. I'm actually going to put the button outside of the, I actually want the button outside of that field set. in its own little list. Oh, I kept it in both places. There we go. All right, so now the button is below that. Now, if I have another field set, let's say for credit card information, it would work something like this. Oops. Uh, 
I am the first field set. I have my second field set for credit card info. And I'm not going to go in and put the other fields for a credit card, but there might be expiration date, name on the card, that sort of thing. So now, you see the form has two big sections, has a billing information section and a credit card section. If I don't want those going all the way uh, across the page, I can just give them a width. So I could say something like field set width 600 pixels, let's say, margin 0px auto. What's the, what does a margin 0px auto do again? It centers it within the container. What's the container for the field set? Container for the field set is the form. And there's no width applied to the form, therefore the width is 100% of available space. Now I could also do cute things styling the, the field set if I wanted to. I could give it a background color. So give it a background color of maybe a light shade of gray. Yeah, don't think I like that. All right, that looks a little better. And so on. I can style it any way I want to. I could theoretically give a background image for the field set if I wanted to. Alright. Now on to a couple of miscellaneous things. Alright. Uh, things that we haven't covered before. Notice that these text boxes are a certain size. Alright. Now, some folks like it like that. Right. Some folks like it the fact that, that all those, that gives it a nice lineup. But you might want to, for example, make the state province smaller, all right? Because again, typically, you know, that's going to be just a couple characters. There's going to be an abbreviation for it. So you have two attributes that exist on a text field, and one of them is the size. And I'll put that one on first. The size sets the physical size of the text box. However, I can still type in as much as I want. So notice I set the size to 5, but I can type all day in that text box. If I want to limit how big that field is in terms of how many characters I can type into it, I can type in, a, I can put a max length 
and that would limit it to just two characters. So now it's the same size, but as I type, it cuts me off at that. <clears throat> this is especially important if you're hooking your application to a script that uses a database on the other end because that database may only be set up to handle two characters for state. And therefore, if you give it more than that number of characters, you're liable to get an error. So that's one way that you can limit that. I'm going to throw some miscellaneous things here. I'm going to just create a miscellaneous field set that really I'm just putting in as an example of some of the controls. Two else? Okay. It just didn't look right. I'm going to put in a password control. And the password control notice as you type in is not echoed. So you just get a little placeholder for the character that you typed in. I'm going to put a hidden field. What's a hidden field? A hidden field is hard to explain until we talk, uh, until you learn more about server-side scripting. But if there's a value that needs to get passed to a script that the user doesn't have to type in, that comes from somewhere else, you can put it in a hidden field. So it's something that's often used with server-side script just as a place to like tuck away some data that you might need later on. So for example, if I go and I click submit, you actually see on the query string my hidden greeting, even though it's nowhere on the form. All right. So it's just a way to, to tuck some data away. All right. There are a couple more, uh, oh, um, text area. A text area is like a text box, except it is for multiple rows and columns of, of data, multiple lines. A text box is used for just like one line of data, like your name or a phone number or whatever. A text area can be used for multiple lines.
So I'll put a text area in here. And again, we can type in as much as we want. We can set the size of a text area by typing in rows and columns. So I could say I want there to be 80 rows and 50 columns. So that will set up my field like that. The interesting thing is, even though I specified that size, I can still type more in. That's just the size that it displays on the screen. So I specified a certain number of rows and columns. Why didn't I pick a smaller number? In fact, I'm going to go and do that. Let's say 10 rows and 40 columns. There you go. Even though there's 10 rows, what that's relating to is that's how many rows are visible. I can sit there and type in that text area all day. Now, that's not always a good thing, right? What if you have a database on the other end that only expects to be uh, a couple hundred characters? Or like Twitter, for example, only, only expects 140 characters. Well, that's not an HTML issue. That's actually a JavaScript issue to, to limit it to um, uh, be a certain number of characters. So we can specify a size in the HTML, but as far as limiting to the number of characters, that is a JavaScript thing. All right? Now, last, I think last, but not least, well, yeah, last but least, uh, we're going to look at a couple of buttons. One you should never use. All right, but we're going to show it to you uh, just so you, if you see it, you, you know to run in the opposite direction. And that is, one of them is the reset button. The reset button, what does it do? It says everything back to its defaults. So it gets rid of all the fields. Now why do I say that you should rarely use that? Well, you're liable to confuse people and they're liable to press the wrong button. If there's two choices, people are going to get, people are going to, on occasion, pick the wrong one. If there's only one choice, people aren't going to pick the wrong one, right? If there's only one button to press, pretty obvious which one to press. I guess I would say that, that, there, there, that there's a much more greater likelihood of harm being from this button than good, all right? Let's think of this case. If I go to start to place an order in, you know, and I start to fill in my information. Am I liable at some point to say, wait a minute, that's not me. That's someone else. I better go back and start over from scratch. Probably not, right? If anything, maybe I typoed. Or maybe I decided, gee, I don't want this shipped to my work address. I want it shipped to my home address. In which case, I'd go in and I could just change those couple of fields. All right? So I don't think in a form like this, anyhow, there's really a lot of benefit in, in providing it. Um, 
to be sure, you know, maybe on some occasions it would be useful, but for the most part, people can just go and retype the fields in that they want to type, as opposed to hitting clear first. But the chance of someone accidentally clicking on the wrong button is much greater. All right? It was mentioned that LC's registration page has that. Which, how do you get to that? My campus? And then go to what? Cert Schedule a class. All right. Yeah. Look at this. Uh, you know. All right. Select subject. All right. C I S S. Well, I, I, I want to go to a lot of trouble. I want to pick a class on these days. And I want where the name is exactly Zellers. Notice they don't have is not on that list. I might add that feature just from experience in my academic career. But notice what happens. You go through this whole thing and enter all this criteria in and you, if you don't look closely, you might click clear criteria. In which case, what does it do? It wipes out everything that you typed in in there. Now, what's particularly bad about this, as was pointed out, is number one, they're right side by side. All right. So at a glance, you could easily click on it. Number two what's bad about this is actually the clear criteria is before the search. So, you know, that sort of, you know, if I see something first in a list, I think that's the one I'm, I'm more likely to pick. All right. Lastly, the clear criteria button is actually larger than the search button. Right. So, usually if you see something larger, you tend to think it's a more important thing. Um, they are different colors, but it's not immediately clear wh what those colors mean. Yes? I was going to say that maybe it was red. Yeah, right, right. That, that would actually be better. If it were smaller red and off to the side, that might be better. Because I could see you, you doing this. You know, I could see wanting to clear the criteria you get so far. You know, that's a little different than a scenario that I whimsically described of realizing you're not the person that you started to type in. I could see you wanting the clear criteria. But again, now, I will hear, I, I'm, I'm sure if, if, you know, I'm sure there are some software developers or web developers who would say this. What? Can't people read? Do we have to do everything for them? Clear criteria? Well, there's a great book on web design that addresses this very issue and it's called Don't Make Me Think. The point is, is yes, people can read, but the mere fact that they have to stop and think about, gee, what button to press diminishes the usability for that. All right? And if they, made, if they either eliminated it or took some of the suggestions that we had, maybe putting it off to the side, putting it after, putting it, making it smaller, you know, um, we can make buttons bigger, right? Mm -hmm. Not the clear criteria, so it should right. be your first choice. Right, so it should be the first choice. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I definitely will go with that. I can make buttons bigger, right? I can say Again, we wouldn't only want to make it red in case someone's colorblind, but we could do 
and put a couple of criteria on here and then just give those respective buttons an ID. But yeah, your point very well taken. Your whole purpose of this is to do a search. Therefore, that's your most important option. It should be the biggest. It should appear first and so on. All right. Are you going to get that one wrong? <laughs> Probably not. All right. So, there is one more kind of button that's just a plain old button. A button button. Button type equals button. And we'll talk about that when we talk about JavaScript because there's really no point in talking about it now because it doesn't do anything. We won't be able to observe any, any behavior on it at all. So when we talk about JavaScript, we'll do that. The remainder of classes, we will talk a little bit about design for mobile um, websites. All right? And then we will talk about JavaScript. We will talk enough about JavaScript to hopefully give you a notion of what the capabilities are uh, without necessarily making you uh, an expert in it. All right. See you up in lab. Yes? For accessibility purposes, should a label be used with all uh, four elements? Um, all is a big word. You know, I realize that I'm not running for president, so I don't necessarily need to watch my words that closely. But yeah, I would probably say all, but uh, there might be an exception, but not one doesn't pop to mind. So yeah. <laughs>